morning. How are you? I am good. Signing up for a half marathon. Yeah, late last night. I thought, why not? <laughs> you know what? I need a big goal in front of me. So anyone who's got any half, you know, training, running trips. Okay, okay. Can I just say to you, because as a firm, we've signed up for the Boston Marathon and Rob has started his marathon preparation to lead us in it. I've also started running. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You run? Yeah, yeah. For the last three weeks, I've been doing it three days a week. Just oh, look at the secret bit... squirrel yeah, business. I would have ever, would have ever. I'm using it as two things. One is exercise and also tramping down the track to make it flatter on the way because of my size. Right. How thoughtful <laughs> and considerate of you. Yes, yeah, so a half marathon. Yeah, uh, that, is, that is still half of a marathon, Andrew. So I don't know marathons for me yet, but it's been, I haven't run no, I'm since. No, I'm not doing a marathon. I'm going to Boston to drink, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very exclusive. I want to go to Harvard and do a course while yeah. I'm there. That's my idea. But yeah, I'm, I'm going to support. There's about eight of the guys who are really keen on participating at some level in the marathon. Yeah. So that's what 2022, we're off as a team. Yeah, I'll see how I go. This is July. I know. So. Plenty of time to prepare. We'll see. We'll see. Anyway, how, how are you going this week? Uh, really good. You had a COVID test. They said, no, I spoke to my doctor over the phone. They said, no need to worry. And they said, but you're bringing a cold to work. And the person went and locked himself in the room angrily. But we've got a person who's come to work and is happy to spread an illness, whatever that illness is, untested, mm. but happy to spread an illness. It raises two issues, doesn't it? One, the perception of other people, why are you coming to work? So there are people who are genuinely scared in the office, that's mm. one thing. And secondly, the issue I've talked to you about before is why would you bring an illness to work where you know you're going to hurt other people with that illness? Mm. And you know you're going to damage productivity. And why as, as organisations aren't we saying serious misconduct mm. so I, I think there's some really interesting discussions i mean one of the answers was clearly to say well you must wear a proper fitting mask the whole time mm. and you must avoid people and maybe in the manufacturing business that's something which is an answer depending on the level of sickness that a person has but quite clearly in an office environment someone coming to work just should be at home yeah, yeah. anyway look just interesting i said this would keep coming up it keeps coming up but the thing i didn't quite understand is the level of internal hysteria that someone coming to work sick causes mm. and the level of fear that that drives as well. And so it should. Mm. Yeah. I think we're pretty close to time, Karen. Yeah. So we have a pretty interesting week, don't we? We've got three great cases today, I think. We've got one which sits across the safety employment law barrier, dealing with uh, safety breaches and how employment law deals with it and shows how commissioners don't actually understand safety law. But I get that in early. Second, we have a pure safety case, which brings into bear a systems of work issue, which we're going to talk about in safety governance later. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have a discrimination case, which is a novel case, which I won't spoil the fun in now, but you won't be able to keep a straight face during it. No, I won't. We're then going to do RHS safety governance. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit, Karen's going to do a very practical pack, uh, piece with a very good infographic. Uh, and then we go on to the problem. The problem's a fascinating problem this way. So let's kick off. I think we should kick off with the first case, which yes. is uh, Drowsley and RTL mining. Drowsley was a mine operator. He drove a truck. He'd had two prior incidents, uh, safety breaches in the year beforehand. The truck he drove had a handbrake that didn't work. His manager, Kilprin, knew it didn't work. And Kilprin was charged with doing pre-vehicle checks, which he hadn't done for a period of five months. Um, Drowsley parked the truck incorrectly, which created a risk. The, trick, the truck careered on after it got out of it and crashed and not didn't kill or injure anyone, but could have easily done immeasurable damage within a mine, including killing people. So a very serious incident. Mm. Um, RTL sacked Drowsley after giving him a show cause notice and Kilpin got a first and final warning. Had the commissioner quite rightly said that there's a disproportionate treatment of the two people and that they are equally equally liable for what occurred. Mm -hmm. In any event, there's equal wrongdoing that sits there. And therefore, under the doctrine of condemnation, you can't punish that which you permit. You can't say to you, final warning, Andrew, you're sacked. Therefore found that although there was a valid reason, remember that's the, the gateway towards dismissal, valid reason. The next question is it harsh, unjust or unreasonable? Remember, um, harsh would be if someone had 20 years experience and you, you terminate them without any proper basis. Uh, with, with a proper basis, but they've had such good experience, you shouldn't do it. Uh, unreasonable might be, um, uh, sorry, un unreasonable is where it ended up here, which is where well, you can't do one thing for another and one thing for that. So 
I found unreasonable. The problem with this case is clearly the commission didn't understand safety law because the person who should have been sacked unquestionably was the manager. Mm. Because that is the person who has the safety governance obligation to satisfy the person that the vehicle is safe. And all of you remember all the drilling, which is the first reckless endangerment case in Australia, where the supervisor knew the brake wasn't working function, functioning mm -hmm. correctly, the vehicle wasn't safe to drive, and allowed someone to drive it. Pretty similar, okay? Pretty similar. In fact, if Kilpern, if there had been a death here or a serious incident, Kilpern could have successfully been charged with reckless endangerment. Drowsley could never have been charged with that. Mm. He would have been charged with, in Victoria, what's called a Section 25 breach for failing to exercise reasonable care to prevent injury. Yeah. So we, we haven't quite got that crossover, have we, between what is safety law and what is employment law, mm. but the outcome is right here. But the last part of this case, which is great, is because Drowsley had a history of bad safety performance, he couldn't be reinstated because the RTO was able to say, look, we just don't have trust and confidence in this guy around safety. Mm. So a few things that come out of that. First, valid reason. Condonation yeah. shows, no, 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 you lose. Yeah. But sacking people for a valid safety reason will always be a good basis for preventing reinstatement. And we often deal with issues, don't we, Karen, where we have to move to sack someone. That's what either one of us mm. are talking about. And we know there's an unfairness that sits in the process. Mm. But the bottom line for the employer is to say, look, you're not going to get reinstated. You are going to have to pay some money, but they're not going to get reinstated. Yeah. I get, this case, Andrew, makes me think, just takes me back to being remaining, um, being objective in terms of how you arrive at those decisions. So if, if, a, if a work site has got golden rules in place where people understand that fundamentally, if you breach them, that you will lose your job, that's a summary dismissal piece, that when that occurs, that you can't sack somebody and not sack the other. Yeah. yeah so... And remember, I think in safety, it is always the manager. If managers condone safety breaches, if a manager says it's safe to drive a vehicle and they know it's not safe, they've got to go. Mm. Because well, when they're aware of it as yeah, well, that yeah. is just... Yeah, yeah uh, you know. Look, the next case is um, not one that Karen knew about until this point, <laughs> which is EY against the store. And this was a, a man who was caught on CCTV in a client-facing area with his hand down his pants, apparently masturbating. Did you hear that last bit? Anyway. <laughs> and when confronted with it, said that he had a history of a rash in his pubic area and that he was scratchy. And went to court it's on possible. the went to court on the, like the first example. And the commissioner wasn't satisfied that he had a rash at the relevant time and therefore he didn't have a protected attribute. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I get protected attributes to this. <laughs> therefore... Do we have photographic evidence or something that <laughs> no, leads to no. rely on? Oh, they, they don't say in the case, nor do they show any photographs. But, <laughs> but importantly, in which nobody is talking about because of the facts and the judgment, is just because someone has a protected attribute and they act because of that protected attribute. So imagine he did have a rash. Mm -hmm. What the court quite properly found is that he didn't have the capacity to control his conduct. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to stand in the middle of the store scratching himself if that's what he was doing. And I think there's a pretty strong question that isn't what he was doing. He could have gone somewhere privately and done it. So I want you to think the case is a fun case and I chucked it in, but partly to understand discrimination. One is you have to establish a protected attribute with evidence. Yeah. And our, our obligations to observe and monitor people mean that if someone does have a protected attribute, Privacy law, nobody gets in the road of us understanding what that protected attribute is. We're allowed to get the evidence off. What we can't do is Karen can't say I've got a protected attribute and we go, okay. Mm. We need to be satisfied that there is an attribute to be protected so that we can make reasonable adjustments around the management of the person. Now, I don't know, other than put big gloves on. I'm just on, trying to think. Putting, putting big gloves on <laughs> this guy. <laughs> just thinking practically, how does that work? But, um, yeah, I don't know what it is. It's got to be some pretty powerful cream, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but the second part is just because somebody does have a problem doesn't mean that it can be the excuse for bad yeah. behaviour. Okay? Yeah. So that's EY v. The Store. Okay? Last case, rocketing on towards where we're moving in safety. Are you glad I've moved on? Yeah. I'm glad we moved on. <laughs> is Comcare and um, Clean Away Operations. Uh, this goes back to the orbit drilling case in the sense of the facts of the case and plays right into our governance issues we're about to speak about. In this case, there was a new driver. Uh, he just got his hybrid, his heavy vehicle license. He was asked to drive a substantial vehicle in circumstances in city traffic which he'd not experienced before. Nobody had supervised or was satisfied that he was competent to drive the truck when he drove the truck. 
we drove the truck and killed two people. Um, and what happened at the end is Comcare made eight charges against Cleanway, who was the operator, saying they had supervised, so they had trained, they had satisfied their competent breach of systems. People are talking about it being a really important case. It's actually not that important, but what it brings back is if I put you to work on plant, I need to know that you're a certified neighbour to work on it. But that's not the end of it, Karen, is it? You've got to be satisfied that the person has been properly inducted and trained to use it safely. Mm -hmm. You've got to know that the person is competent to use it and to use it safely. Mm -hmm. And you've got to have a system that satisfies you on a continuing basis because remember, that's what reasonably practical is. Reasonably practical says, is there a hazard? In this case, a bit of plant drives on wheels through crowded cities mm -hmm. is a hazard. Mm -hmm. And it's a high risk when you measure its risk. So what are the controls? Well, obviously, highly competent and skilled alert driver. So where is the system? And to do that, you've got to apply resources. No resources are applied. So this was a lay down was there. They were always going to lose. But Karen, how often do we hear about people who are forklift drivers who got a license two years ago and haven't actually used that forklift? Or they've got a license for one forklift and not for a heavier lot, mm -hmm. and they're using it. Yep. You meant to say more than yes, that was your time for comment. <laughs> We've got, well, we've, we've got a minute and 10 seconds left, right. which well, is Well, I shall comment. fill it up, yes. Then my comment on that is, yes, that is actually very, very common. Um, and in terms of just not even um, having a licence, but being assessed as competent. And when I say that, someone who's got 10 years' experience on a forklift, by the way, doesn't necessarily mean that they would be competent in your environment. The operating context is different from place to place, depending on the nature of the work. Um, yeah, just as I said, context. I think you filled it up well okay. done. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> And the next one I'm going to ask you to comment on for it, okay? okay? So we're going to move over to safety governance, all right? And that's what today was. Last week we did HR governance. The first thing I guess to say is what is an officer in the business is the same as an officer under corporation. Okay? Stop giggling. We're not talking about that other case, all right? So I want you to understand that safety governance, like industrial relations, is not a bolt-on to the business. It's actually built on the company strategy and the diligence required of all officers in an organisation. And that means that all officers must understand in respect of safety. Um, what is the state of knowledge of the business of safety? Are they up to date on relevant safety law that applies to the nature of the business? Do they know the nature of the operations? So Karen's in charge of um, finance. Well, yeah, there's some stuff in finance which is safety related. But if she's an officer, she's responsible across the whole business. So she must know the hazards of the, the business as a whole. Mm -hmm. She must know that there are resources applied to meet those hazards and risks. So there must be an allocation. And how often I look at budgets sitting around safety plans and all they have is PPE. Mm. They don't have capital expenditures in there. They don't have supervisory costs that exist in there. None mm. of those things are in there, but they must be as a matter of law. Mm. And obviously to make them happen, you need to be deliberate with the allocation of resources. So they do happen, because if you're not deliberate about it, it just doesn't happen. The leaders of that organisation must under know, understand what are the major hazards and risks in the organisation. They should know the top 10 or 15 across the organisation. Mm -hmm. They have no excuse for not knowing that. They need to know that their safety system, and Karen will talk more about a safety system, but remember a safety system has six elements. The safety plan, the strategic plan, and that, that goes down through the organisation right down to safe operating mm -hmm. and down the bottom, but the plan, what are the processes that sit beneath that plan to execute it? What is the training which is competency based to carry out those processes? Do you have the supervision that's skilled in the plan, the processes and the training? Is there a monitoring system that exists that satisfies you that those things? And finally, you need to verify that resources have actually been applied and used. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that's just basic due diligence of what an officer is. That's the safety smell of it. If we're dealing with it in financial liquidity, it would be the same thing, but with the financial liquidity issues at this time. Their report structure should have clarity around what are the incident, clear incidents that have occurred and how did the safety system supply them and was, was there a gap? Mm -hmm. They need to look at what are the major hazards as an ambulatory look at how they pass them. Are we beating these major hazards? What are the controls? Do we need more resources? Major hazards. They then need to look at what are the lead indicators of the plan. 
So the plan says to get from A to B, these are the lead indicators around behaviours, training, investment. You need to be constantly looking at those lead indicators because that tells you whether you're safe. And not that important, and even treats the important is lead indicators. That shows where we've broken someone, mm -hmm. okay? Or where there's things. Now, that doesn't matter much because it doesn't show when we miss injuring somebody. It's relevant to the stage because it goes to cost, so it goes to premium cost, but I don't want focus in a reporting structure and safety ever to be on lag indicators. It's a terrible mistake yep. to go to the bottom of the measurement. Mm -hmm. You should be always looking towards the better and more accurate measurement. So for me, so for me, Karen, that's safety governance in a nutshell. Yep. Knowing what due diligence means and building the capacity in the leadership group around these issues so they make the right inquiries. You've seen my board reports. What is the, when we deal with safety, what is the problem we're trying to solve or the opportunity we're trying to get? What is the evidence around that that we're trying to deal with? What are the questions that should be asked? What are the issues that arise? What is the resolution of the sort? That's the way all board papers should be structured. If we understand that, then we know how to build our capacity around our offices. Now, Karen, that's my part of it, and it's over to you. Thank you. So, so have we got a slide that we're loading up? Yeah, Soph's loading up the slide. Soph is on the ball today, can I say? Yeah, she's She's fantastic. really on the ball. She's wearing Adidas runner. She's moving very quickly. <laughs> He's trying to be genuine, Sophie. Anyway, <laughs> um, so really, this roadmap that I've got here around OHS governance really just um, captures what you've just talked us through, anyway, Andrew. So, in terms of the reason why we have an OHS governance um, framework in place is to maintain the integrity, similar to what we covered off last week around HR, the integrity of our safety systems, our processes, our practices, to make sure that everything is working as intended, okay, and, and working, but working also well. So with that, I've created this little roadmap for you and it all starts off again, we emphasise all the time around leadership and accountability, because you can have any framework, you can have any process policy in place, but if you don't have the leaders who breathe life into it um, to execute the right change, nothing's going to happen anyway, it'll all just... And you know, nobody will follow, which is... No, the, it's just rhetoric. Which is the Drowsley case we talked about before. Yeah, definitely. So with that, in terms of the OHS governance part of it as well, how does it tie in with the organisation strategy? So again, if all it is is just an expense line for PPE in your overall budget, then I'm afraid we've, we've got a bigger issue yeah. um, on our hands. Following that, if you're clear in terms of how safety supports your strategy and how safety supports your business, right? there's a business case for that, how do you then operationalise that? So when I say operationalising that in terms of what is the what needs to happen, and flowing through from that is how do you resource it? Well, well, perhaps to just go back a little bit, Karen, because I'm sorry, I'm jumping into your part now and I shouldn't be doing it. But I think the strategy part is the biggest issue. And it is the biggest Because yeah. if you, safety, any block to safety means you won't be safe. Mm. So unless safety connects with the output of the business, unless it's operationally driven, you'll never get safety. You never get safety by having a policeman. Because when the policeman's not on the floor, no one's being safe. They're trying to be operational. Mm. So it, unless safety is integrated into the operational output and creates profit or yep. creates service to the group, you're not for profit. Unless it's doing that, it will always fail. Yep, absolutely. Agreed. That's, that's my comment. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so going back to resourcing, that's what we were talking about, having um, in terms of safety accountabilities to every single role, so top all the way through to the front line. But having responsibilities and ensuring that the capability is there. So again, if we tie this back to in terms of the operational plan and an investment, what is that? More than just PPE, it's training, right? It's in terms of the right kind of capital, the right type of equipment to actually allow for this place to be safe. Flowing through from that is obviously in terms of controlling, um, putting adequate controls in place, making sure that um, you'll have a way of dealing with safety issues or where there is non-compliance or what, how do we deal and resolve that? And, and part of that in the control and management is also resourcing. So one of the things we've talked about is when you look at the hierarchy of control, as you go down from elimination to, mm -hmm. to administrative, you exponentially increase the level of supervision as you go down. Yes. But that's never allocated in, in role descriptions as a true role of a supervisor. Mm -hmm. So the supervisor almost invariably flat out just supervising operations. And yet we introduce controls, which are administrative or engineering controls, which require supervision, but there's no allocation of time for it. That's exactly and that's where the fatalities occur. It's in that area, mm. not in the elimination part. That's never the issue. Yeah. It's the further you go down that we have the fatalities and in serious incidents because no one was supervising. 
That's it. But that's also, again, if when you're talking about resources and allocating time and money to it, that's exactly what we're talking and about. And that's what has to be integrated into operations because yep. without that lens, you're seeing two different cost centres. Yep. You're seeing cost centre of operations, cost centre of safety, and so operations just goes, no, we've got to keep well, Operations don't see any other alternative. They don't have any. The only way mm. they know how to do it is, oh, well, refresh, retrain, and kind of hope it doesn't happen again. Yeah. So we're going to empower these guys, right? Um, the last bit of it is around monitoring and reporting. And this is an area that I think lots of organisations need to get better at in terms of, so we've got our strategy how and our plan. How are we actually tracking against that? We talked earlier, or you mentioned in terms of critical risks. If we've got six critical risks, we should be reporting month on month in terms of what are the activities around in that space exactly and how are we progressing so how do you know you're going to be better you're better and you're safer without actually doing that um periodically and look i think one of the things your business does brilliantly is creating um, executive and board reports around yeah. safety which yeah. is just we help a few people yeah which yeah. is just a fantastic template and structure that sits around it so yeah i think with that and i know we're going to be closing this off now is around how do we make it easy for people to understand what they're meant to be doing and comply and to do their to do their jobs in this respect. Yeah, and part of that really is having is crystallizing key metrics mm. and using traffic light systems so that people who are making decisions can see with absolute clarity are we achieving, are we not, and they can actually get the gap analysis so that you're having a 20 minute good discussion, mm. not reading for 25 minutes to get the end of the 45 page OHS report, which nobody gets or understands. Yeah. So that's me. Well done, I've got nothing more to comment. Let's move on to the problem. We're actually ahead of time on going to the problem we need to be because it's a bigger problem today. Okay, good. Let's make sure there's a second slide if there's a second there's, slide. There is, Sophie has actually told me, and our face <laughs> just came through the window with two fingers up to remind me this week there are two slides okay. and I need to keep the microphone on, two fingers. All right, Janice is an accounts receivable client for sun-dried fruits proprietary limited. She is shy, singular and careful woman. She has pride in the accuracy of her accounts. Janice manages the bottled fruit lines of SDF and maintains a tidy book with only small customers falling outside of the 30 days, the usual outstanding of 12% of all debtors being over 30 days and 4% over 60 days. 2021 has not been a good year. The new salesman has driven up the sales of bottled fruit, but constantly reassures clients they'll be okay, they need more time to pay. The terms slip every month. Janice tells her boss Fred of the problem. He says she just needs to call more often and collect. The new salesman is called John, a friend of Fred. John keeps telling Janice to leave his clients alone. When terms slip to 24% over 30 days and 15% over 60 days, the CFO speaks to Janice. She says she can't cope with the pressure anymore and tells him everything. He has never seen her cry before. The CFO speaks to Fred and John together and asks them to be gentle. Fred laughs and says she just needs to harden up. Things gets worse in March and Janice starts taking sick leave. She's never taken it before. In a board meeting, the CFO explains what is happening. He has spoken to Fred and John. On 21 March 2021, John and Fred get a terse email from the CEO telling them to fix the problem or both their jobs from the line. He makes it clear not to blame Janice. They both meet up, both meet up and confront Janice and ask if she has complained. She says she did to the CFO. They both shout at her and threaten that she will lose her job unless the numbers improve. Janice is so distressed, she leaves the leaves the site to have a coffee and cigarette across the road. She is weeping and distracted. Those who saw her after said she was falling apart. She doesn't look and as she crosses the road, she's struck by an oncoming truck. All right, sad story. Mm. So let's have a look at what the poll is. Off you go, have a go, see how you go with the poll. Numbers are starting to come in. It's a bit like election night, isn't it? <laughs> Except for it's all blue, Andrew. <laughs> it's all blue, so it's all liberal. Yeah, no red. Yeah. Yeah. We won't reveal our politics too much here. <laughs> there we go. I can't even see that far. We've got many numbers there. Um, yeah, sixty percent completed already. So just give it a few more moments. Let's People are actually getting through really quickly on Let's this. Let's give it fifteen seconds. Then. Yeah, sure. All right, another five to go. Four, three, two, one. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll end the polling here. All right, well, let's just have a bit of a discussion at the start. Oh, we've got we've got the different politics there. Look at that. We've gone red and blue. It's very good. <laughs> um, 
let's just talk about the basic law behind it because it makes a bit more sense just going into answering the problems. So we go to our safety obligation to monitor. We've got employment law at the same time running side by side. The law on monitoring health is that you must do everything um, that is reasonably practical to monitor someone's health. Okay, so with Janice, did we see a hazard arising? Yes, people were treating Janice badly. Her job was starting to go backwards. That is a hazard for her because it was placing stress on her. When she tried to raise the issues, people would poorly behave towards it. Is there a hazard? Absolutely. Was that a risk? Yes, you could see objectively, people could see her declining health. Mm. Okay, so they were aware something was happening. Now remember in Burke and Suncorp, in employment law, when there is a discernible change in the way someone behaves, that reflects they have a health related concern that a reasonable person would observe, then the organisation must intervene. Mm. Okay, now we saw a case called Kubert, which said, but if a reasonable person would have noticed anything different, then you, you know, you're not on liability, but here you are definitely on notice, okay? Both under safety law and employment law. Um, so we've got a person that has an issue. There was no intervention at all, okay? There was an awareness by the officers of the organisation of a risk to Janice. And yet the manner of executing the protection of Janice, given the nature of what they understood, was clearly inadequate, okay? So the first question is, could it be industrial manslaughter in Ellen and Victoria workplace? So that's the first question is, was there a breach of duty? That's the first test in that. Well, one monitoring and the second in providing a safe place of work, unquestionably. So the two, section 21 and 22 in Victoria and mirrored out elsewhere throughout Australia, they to provide a safe place of work, they to provide adequate supervision Okay, section 21's failure to monitor health. So clear breach. If Janice died, you've got the third element, which is death. Mm. Okay, so the next one is, was there criminal negligence? Was there a, a level of negligence which is um, so unreasonable? That is, you exercised a duty of care, they did, they were employees, they had the duty of care to the person. Was the breach of that so extraordinary? I reckon it's a really hard one because I think I think you may get over the line with industrial manslaughter, but I don't think you would. I don't think a court would find industrial manslaughter because the level of negligence is not that high. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was attempts to try and fix it. Yes. Okay. Would it be reckless endangerment? Absolutely. Of, certainly of the CFO and the CEO. Why? Because different tests. Was the risk, the risk of serious injury or death? Yes. Were they aware of that risk and were indifferent to it? And indifferent doesn't mean sending an email, okay? So sending an email is still indifferent. Mm. Now, I think they were really at risk of a reckless endangerment. This is still question one, because although they did things, they were aware her health was deteriorating. They were aware she was being treated badly and they were aware that Fred, her boss, was absolutely indifferent to her. So I'm not sure they'd get over the, over the line with industrial manslaughter. I think there would be a high risk of them being charged with reckless endangerment, particularly the CFO. Anyway, that's just mm. whether it would succeed at the end of the day. Um, I'm not sure. I think it'd be. Uh, I, I think that WorkSafe would do a deal and they'd do it with a primary breach, individual breach. But that's another issue. Could they be charged? Fred and John, could they be charged with reckless endangerment? I think the answer is yes. Okay, their behaviour was utterly indifferent to her plight. They knew they were in the wrong. They knew she was at risk. They'd been told she was at risk, and yet they continued to execute. Well, they were directed. Yeah, they were directed. So I think they could be charged. Remember, reckless endangerment is up to five years jail. Mm. So it's a real one. Is Fred and John's conduct buoyant? So let's do the tests again. Were there repeated acts? Yes, there was. Mm. Were they objectively unreasonable? Did they hurt, humiliate, or intimidate? Yes, they were. Remember, there wasn't just the one at the end. There were several of them along the way. Yeah. And did it affect the safety of work? Yes, it did. So definitely bullying. Was Fred and John's conduct victimisation? Now, that's a, a phrase that doesn't appear in our safety law. It relates to discrimination law, mm -hmm. where it's particularly defined, but is used in its, in its normal vernacular sense throughout all law. And that means to treat someone adversely mm -hmm. as a result of them raising a complaint. Remember, this is an adverse action. This is a classic adverse action thing. Treat someone adversely as a result of them threatening to make or making a complaint in respect of someone's conduct. 100% this is victimisation. 
If Janice Lewis could she bring an adverse action, well, was she ex exercising a workplace right? Did she have a workplace right that's protected? Yeah, she had a vulnerable disposition. She was doing her job and they were interfering in her job. I think she has an adverse action claim. I think because she raised the complaint, which creates that adverse action, mm. that's what's being protected. And then they did this to her. So I think she would have a very significant general damages claim. Um, when we talk about adverse action, it's called compensation, but for the pain that relates to pain, suffering and loss of many, it's understanding as part of compensation. It's quite low in adverse action, that general damages claim, compared to discrimination law, where mm. it's a very substantial and based on common law principles. So you know, up to three hundred thousand dollars in general damages. In adverse action, it's inclined to be much lower, you know, twenty, thirty thousand as a maximum. But nonetheless, her adverse action claim could be very significant. So they're the answers for today. That was a hard problem, wasn't it? Because there were things that were seductive. Because you feel like you want to prosecute someone for industrial manslaughter after that. But the short answer is, don't think you'd get over the line. Mm. So. I want to finish just a fraction earlier, and we have, because I want to remind you, next week is a big, big week. It's number 50. We turn 50. Yep. Oh, God, I wish I could turn 50 again. <laughs> um, we're going to have Clive Q and Kate Norton come along. Clive, CEO of Winchester. Kate, very successful HR practitioner who supports a number of businesses. We we'll talk about the disruption in business this year and how you should manage it culturally. Fascinating to topic and really skilled, talented people that can talk about it and talk about your experience and give some ideas in it. We want your feedback during it. It's a much more live encounter. And the second thing, of course, is we'll have a couple of cases because I wouldn't want to miss out another case like we had this week. Yeah, yeah definitely. That's it from me. All right, excellent. Well, big week next week. We're gonna, well, I'm really looking forward to it. It's going to change the dynamic a little bit because we'll have a few more people involved. Yeah, Luzilla versus Kong. Karen Lou versus Doug Kong. It's happening next week. Who comes up with these ideas anyway? <laughs> All right. <laughs> we Thanks. might even have a graphic for you, Luzilla versus Kong next week, if Sophie will let us put it up. If I let you put it up, more like it. If I'm going to be Luzilla, is that the bad character? No, they're all bad. You know, King Kong's not a well, nice Luzilla character. Well, Luzilla sounds do I, worse. Do I want to be King Kong? No, I don't. Luzilla's bad. At least King Kong is a bit, it's a bit cuter. Like, Luzilla just... Well, it's hairy, like... which is why I chose it. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the debate continues offline. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you, See you next week. Bye-bye.